Let us begin our study of the Westminster Confession of Faith by seeking the divine enlightenment in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the wonderful way in which Thou didst enlighten these servants of Thine who three centuries ago labored so industriously and fruitfully and have bequeathed us such a noble heritage of biblical truth. Guide us particularly as we resume our study of this glorious doctrine of assurance of salvation. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen. We're looking at chapter 18 of Assurance of Grace and Salvation, and particularly at section 3, where the Westminster Divines, as I mentioned last time, are actually taking exception to their greatly admired heroes of the faith, Martin Luther and John Calvin. This is what we read here. This infallible assurance does so, not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he par be partaker of it, yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of ordinary means, attain thereunto. And therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure, that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of assurance. So far is it from inclining men to looseness. Now the reason I mention that the divines here are disagreeing with the theologians with whom they very, very especially agree in the main, namely Luther and Calvin, the great leaders of the Reformation, is that they carefully say that this assurance is not of the essence of faith. Now what they mean by that is that you can have faith without assurance. Whereas if assurance was, as Luther and Calvin both wrongly believed, they think, and I do too, if assurance were of the essence of faith, then if you, my friend, are not assured of your salvation, you're not saved. See, that would be the implication of it. I think most of you realize, without even having read section 3 here, that that's going farther than Scripture does go. And you may wonder why such great theologians, so solidly reformed and so utterly biblical, should make such a sad mistake at this particular point. Well, most of us historians believe that the reason they went astray on that produced partly, human fallibility of course, but partly because of the exigencies of their situation. You have to remember that they were fighting sometimes for their physical life and certainly for their eternal life. A separation was taking place in the 16th century, you'll remember, between that church today called the Roman Church, which came into existence in the 16th century in spite of its claims to the contrary, and the reassertion of the evangelical tradition of the Bible, the early church, and the Middle Ages. And because the Roman Church was anathematizing Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and the others, these persons had to be very sure of what they were doing. All of these major contenders in the Reformation period believed in the legitimacy of the use of force, for one thing. We'll face this later on when we come to the chapter dealing with a civil magistrate. But Rome felt very free using any imperial armies it could to wipe out Protestantism if it were possible, overthrow Protestant monarchs and so on, justify tyrannicide and the like of it. So the reformers were struggling for their physical existence, but far more serious than that, they were being anathematized with the kind of charges, for example, that Rome made against Savonarola at the end of the preceding century. When Savonarola, who was a monk, came under the censure of the Church of Rome and was burned before he was executed, the solemn words were uttered, we cut you off from the church 
militant now. And we cut you off from the church triumphant hereafter. In other words, Rome felt it had the ability, the authority, and the responsibility to cut souls off, not only from this world, but from the world to come. And in their opinion, that anathema meant not only possibly death in this world, but certainly eternal death in the world to come. Now, when you're living in a context like that, with the enemy breathing down your back militarily, and far more seriously theologically, you've got to be pretty sure what you're doing. There can't be, as we would say, any ifs and ands and buts about it. This can't be a speculative possibility. You're not going to live like that, a life like that on a hypothesis. You've got to be pretty sure of yourself. And I think, and most historians think, that the reason they do adopted this doctrine was that very fact that they had to be sure. But I think the divines, perhaps, are able to see more clearly. They're living a century after. Protestantism is established in England. They're meeting under the auspices of the government and with its approval, and so on. You can say they breathe more easily and they think more freely, but be what, what it may, they think more accurately. They are right when they say that faith is not of the essence. You can have faith without assurance. You can't have true assurance, of course, without faith. The distinction we make today is the difference between the assurance of faith and the assurance of hope. The every true Christian has to be sure of the doctrines of faith. You can't be a Christian and doubt that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can't waver on the atonement. There's no possibility of not realizing that justification is by faith alone and committing yourself to that. You can, on the other hand, be assured that the Bible is the Word of God, Jesus is the Son of God, the atonement is the salvation of God, justification is the way of reconciliation. You can be absolutely sure of those things and still not have assurance of hope. That is, you can't have the assurance of salvation without this, but you can have salvation without that. I mean, you can't even have salvation without this. You can't have salvation without that. What's the difference? This is an assurance of the verities of the Christian religion, without which there can't be any Christianity. This is where orthodoxy is indispensable. The fundamentals of the faith are rightly so called. They are fundamental. They're foundational. Without that, there is no Christian religion. You can call it Christianity. The witnesses have that privilege, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the people of the way, and the Mormons, and hosts of others can go around the world calling themselves Christians, but we will say to the last day, they have no right to do so when they deny that Jesus Christ is a unique Son of God, and that God is triune in His nature, and the Bible is the Word of God, and justification is faith by faith alone, and the satisfaction of Jesus Christ, and so on. This is indispensable to the Christian religion. But this, you see, the assurance of hope is an assurance that I personally have a hope of eternal salvation, that I will be ultimately saved. I'm not only certain about the verities of the Christian religion, I'm not only sure preaching that if anybody's going to be saved, it's by the one name Jesus, and that there's only one mediator between God and men. I can be absolutely inflexibly certain about that, and yet not be certain that I myself have a saving faith in it. I have a faith in it, an assurance of faith, what the New England theologians used to call historical faith, but do I personally have a faith which guarantees my everlasting salvation? According to the Westminster divines, this is not essential, highly desirable as we shall see, but not indispensable to true Christian religion. And at that point, they departed for the better, I think, from the Reformation divines. Section 4 reads, true believers may have the assurance of their salvation divers ways shaken, diminished, and intermitted, as by negligence and preserving of it, by falling into some special sin which woundeth the conscience and grieveth the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, 
by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light, yet are they never utterly destitute of that seed of God and life of faith, that love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty, out of which by the operation of the Spirit this assurance may in due time be revived, and by which in the meantime they are supported from utter despair. Now this is saying to us that assurance is possible, we're warned about a, a false assurance, it is highly desirable and can be attained by walking carefully in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, but at the same time it can be intermitted as well. So though you may be a Christian without having assurance today, desirably you will be Christian and have assurance of salvation, but though you'll have salvation tomorrow and to all eternity, you may not have assurance tomorrow, and you may not have assurance ever. There are undoubtedly many people who have gone to heaven insecure all the way. When the confession mentioned at one point, you know, that this assurance didn't depend upon a special revelation, there again it was not only referring to Rome, which so contends that assurance is a false thing, it's presumption in every case, unless you've had a special communication from heaven, but even the great Augustine fell into that particular error. He too thought that any kind of assurance was presumption, and Rome unfortunately followed him in his error, as they've often followed him in many of his truths as well. But the confession is rightly saying God does not have special revelations. He doesn't say, John Gerster, you're my child. I wish he did. <laughs> if he spoke from heaven and saying, this is a converted child of mine, and he likes, I would to God, he said, he doesn't. And if I thought he did it, I know I'd be suffering hallucinations. And he doesn't reveal himself in that particular way. But on the other hand, he doesn't say with Augustine, you can't know, John, unless I specially speak to you by a miraculous communication. You may know by the simple, wonderful business of walking in my ways, communing with me constantly, living a life of abiding in that vine while his surging life goes through your being and issues in the good works that Westminster has talked about. But at the same time, Westminster is reminding me that if I ever have that kind of assurance, which is highly desirable and really possible, well, I'm warned at the same time, beware of carnal presumption and so on. But even if it's not carnal but genuine, it still may be lost. And if I don't have it tomorrow, as I have it today, I'll be a sadder person, but I'll not be lost if I really am in a state of grace. If you were going to put this chapter in a sentence, it would be this. Beware of false assurance. Strive for genuine assurance, which may be attained or may not, but at the same time, even when attained, may be intermitted. Now we come to chapter 19 of the law of God number of uh, sections here that uh, are quite important, as you shall see. The first section of the law of God reads, God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience, promised life upon the fulfilling, and threatened death upon the breach of it, and endued him with power and ability to keep it. Now remember when we were discussing before, what I mentioned was a historically significant uh, phenomenon, namely that Westminster was champion of the concept of covenant theology. We had this discussed in some detail. Now we're focusing on it in even more detail. And the first sense in which the law of God was communicated to man was when man was first created, and the form of it was the covenant of works, whereby God required persons to obey. See, the principle of it was obedience. We've noted that already. And this is the watering of that dead stick that I talked about and so on. That's the fundamental principle. God gives the commandments. We render from the heart and in outward behavior the obedience that is necessary. And we pointed out that there was something even gracious 
in the law of God at that time because the promise God had made to Adam, had he persevered in obedience, was eternal life not only for himself but for his posterity, which he could never have earned by being obedient, which would, being obedient would have simply have been his duty anyway, and so on. There was a certain graciousness in it, but at the same time, as you know, we were all plunged into ruin because our great representative, the first Adam, did not continue ob in obedience. Some people have observed that had he continued in obedience, it would have been obedience unto life. Whereas the second Adam, when he came, he was obedient unto death. If the first Adam had persevered in obedience, he and we would all have lived eternally. For us to live in Christ meant that he had to be obedient to death. He had to die, and in him we die with him. So life in the first case was related, I mean, eternal life was related to obedience and continual living, and in the second case, to obedience to very death. But so much for the covenant of works, which it mentions here, and the second proposition pursues that a little bit further. This law, after his fall, continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness, and as such was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in ten commandments and written in two tables. The first four commandments continue, containing our duty toward God, and the other six, our duty to man. So the, this is not a reenactment of the covenant of works, you'll notice. Some the, this is a very difficult point here, and I have no adequate time to deal with it, but just let me say, some people, theologians of real stature, have tended to argue that the covenant of works was reissued with Israel at Sinai. Now, of course, that <laughs> couldn't possibly be because the covenant of works had brought ruin to everybody. The only thing that could be new for the people of Israel would be a different covenant, not the old covenant. And what Westminster is saying here is not commenting directly on that subject, and there could very well have been some division of opinion among them. As I say, I can't take time for a historical detour here, but if I had time, I think you'd find it uh, quite interesting. We'll just have to stick to the fact that they mention not that the covenant of works is reissued, but that that which was the substance of it, namely what amounts to the Ten Commandments. See, it wasn't spelled out as Ten Commandments in Eden. It was spelled out in the form of Ten Commandments at Sinai. Christ spells it out in terms of two commandments, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and thy neighbor as thyself, and really as one commandment. Because the way Christ says it, the first commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and a second which really means derivative therefrom, is the commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you see. And Paul himself does reduce it explicitly to one commandment. Love is the fulfilling of the law. So the love of God is the sum and substance of it all. It was spelled out in one particular form in the garden, and it was the basis of a covenant of works. It was spelled out in ten commandments at Sinai. It was spelled out in one commandment in the New Testament, but it's always the same, and only uh, the ten are just samples. The love of God in a million different cases. Some cases it is spelled out specifically in forms of ten words, but you know and I know that if we're going to keep the law of God, we have to love God and our neighbor and ourselves with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind all the time, in every situation. That's the controlling principle that's inalienable. And sometimes it's excruciatingly difficult to know what the love of God demands when God himself has not actually told us in so many words. But that is the law in its essence. That's the reason we say, oh, how love I thy law. But that comes later. Section 3. Besides this law, commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church under age. Please notice that expression. Israel was a church just younger than we are, that's all. Israel is the church in a childhood. We're the chi church in maturity, but it's the same body. It's the same church. As I say, uh, Westminster's as anti-dispensational as it's possible to be, and says so explicitly at times and implicitly all the time. 
But the people of Israel, as a church under age, receive these ceremonial laws also, containing several typical ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, His graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, and partly holding forth diverse instructions of moral duties, all which ceremonial laws are now abrogated or done away with under the New Testament. Now we'll see this, uh, we'll see the um, law, you see, uh, already manifested in two forms. The first is the moral form, and different manifestations of it have been mentioned. The second is the ceremonial law, and it says about the ceremonial law, it is completely done away with now. Nobody has an obligation to offer bulls and goats and turtle doves and pigeons and so on now. As a matter of fact, it would be a sin to do so, just as it's a very wicked sin to celebrate the Day of Atonement 2,000 years after the atonement was made. But everybody recognized, including those who engage in that particular type of perfidy, that you don't continue animal sacrifices. Why they don't, I don't know, inasmuch as they do not accept the Lamb of God. But at any rate, the ceremonial law is not only not binding on you and me as Christians, it would be a downright sin for us to observe it because they pointed to the Christ who has fulfilled it and when He died, split the veil of the temple down, down the middle to teach us graphically that that was the end because of the ceremonial law because that toward which the Lamb of God, it pointed, had come and died for the remission of our sins. Now here comes another form of law in section number four. To them also, as a body politic, he gave sundry judicial laws, which expired together with the state of the people. Not of that people, the Jews, that is, Israel. Not obliging any other now further than the general equity thereof may require. So we see a third form of uh, law, the judicial law. Now see, this abides forever. This is never abrogated. It is not changed. This served a temporary purpose and it is now abrogated forever. This is abrogated in one sense of the word as a ceremonial law is and continues in another sense as the moral law does. Now Westminster doesn't say much more than that and those of you who are familiar with the modern movement called theonomy know that this is uh, very central to theonomic thinking. All the theonomists I know of are Reformed people and have a very great basic agreement with the Westminster Confession of Faith. And uh, the real question going on now that we, again, we don't have any kind of adequate time to discuss here and so on, just how much of the judicial laws of Moses in the Old Testament continue to this day? Westminster says those which were given specifically to that body politic, is not only an ecclesiastical body, but a body politic as well, has disappeared with that body politic. Christianity is not now necessarily associated with any body politic. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, but in the Old Testament days it was inseparably connected with it. So it, it was mandatory then, and since that body for which it was mandatory has passed away, it is no longer mandatory. But the Confession has this interesting statement, it's not obliging any other now further than the general equity thereof may require. Okay. So that's the part which does continue, what's called here the general equity, and it's not spelled out. Usually equity means fairness, and the implication would be that Westminster would be saying, and remember Westminster had a relation like this. After all, the Reformed Church was established in England at the time this was written. It's called the Anglican Church. That was the Reformed Church. It had a different form of government than the Westminster was favoring and so on, but it nevertheless was an established form of Reformed Christianity, and still is to a much lesser degree, but still is in Britain. Now, this is simply saying it's not mandatory for a Christian community to reenact those laws which were given for the body politic Israel, which has ceased to be, and so on, except as far as fairness requires. It would seem to suggest here, this is as far as I dare go right now, that anything in the Old Testament political law, which is appropriate to modern political situations and so on, 
would be appropriate. So that's the qualified sense in which it does continue and yet does not continue, whereas this clearly does continue and this clearly does not continue. Number five says, the moral law doth forever, going back to the moral law, which is by far the most important because the most permanent and so on, the moral law doth forever bind all, as well justified persons as others, to the obedience thereof, and that not only in regard to the matter, the commandments themselves contained in it, but also in respect to the authority of God, the Creator who gave it, Neither doth Christ in the gospel any way dissolve, but much strengthen this obligation. You see, this is saying something very significant, that the Ten Commandments are obligatory upon every person in the wide, wide world. At that time, this time, and any other time, because they are creatures of God, it doesn't make any difference whether they're atheists. It doesn't make any difference whether they're animists. It doesn't make any difference whether they're polytheists. It doesn't make any difference whether they're secularists. They're the creatures of God, and this is the commandment of God, and it is mandatory upon them. Even if they use the name of Christ for no other no purpose than cursing and so on, they are accountable for obeying the commandments of Christ. And when they're summoned before that great judge of heaven and earth, they are going to be condemned if found guilty of disregarding the commandments of Jesus Christ on any ground of God whatsoever, is what's said here. And Christ so far from doing away with the law actually strengthens this obligation. They obviously are thinking of Matthew 5, 17, I did not come to destroy the law but to fulfill it. Not a jot or a tittle shall pass from the law until everything is fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away. My law will never pass away. That's what the divines are saying with great vigor, and we in this very immoral age, this sensate age, as Sorokin would say, this total defiance of the moral law, that we are going to have to answer to the God of heaven and earth. I was just talking to a friend yesterday, just came back from a European trip and was surprised to find that everybody else traveling with her was an unbeliever. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't, they didn't believe in hell. That's the first thing that shocked them, shocked her. Then she discovered they didn't believe in heaven either. They didn't believe in a number of things. Educators, too, mind you. Didn't believe anything. All right. There's no God. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no law. There's no, no, there's no this, there's no that. Well, Westminster is saying, I don't care what you say. You are under this obligation. We don't care what you believe. You're going to be accounted for believing the truth. It doesn't make any difference whether you call yourself sincere or not, or whether you're well, willing to die for your error or not. The judge of heaven and, the earth, and earth made you, and he's going to call you to account in that particular day. This is an awesome word for our time. Pluralism, meaning everybody can go his own particular way. According to God, there's only one way you can go. You have the opportunity of going all these other ways, but you're going to have to give an account for it the last day. And there's only one way that's going to pass that particular examination. Again, uh, uh, I'll just read uh, six, six here to get it in your thinking. We'll resume our study in the, uh, in the next, next, next lecture. Although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of works. See, this is where, how does the law relate to us who are saved by grace? See? Although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of works to be thereby justified or condemned, yet it is of great use to them as well as to others in that as a rule of life informing them of the will of God and their duty, it directs and binds them to walk accordingly, discovering or revealing also the sinful pollutions of their nature, hearts, and lives, so as examining themselves here, thereby they may come to further conviction of humiliation for and hatred against sin, together with a clearer sight of the need they have of Christ and the perfection of His obedience it is likewise of use to the regenerate to restrain their corruption in that it forbids sin and the threatenings of it serve to show what even their sins deserve and what afflictions in life they may expect for them, although freed from the curse thereof, threatened in the law, the promises of it in like manner show them God's approbation of obedience and what blessings they may expect upon the performance thereof, although not as due to them by the law of a covenant of works, so as a man's doing good and refraining from evil, because the law encourages to the one and deterreth from the other, is no evidence of his being under the law, but being under grace. I'll see you in the next lecture.